had a formal launch for in March, but now is coming to fruition and reality. So what I'm talking, of course, about the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, which will be based in the research park um, and is launching its fir first cohort starting in January. Um, we're thrilled that Jack Mark has been hired to be the program's managing director. Um, Jack has experience working in um, ag tech, worked at ag tech startup in the research park and has, has seen the fruition of uh, taking uh, a, a company from uh, its roots into a and in and, and watching it as it went through uh, an exit. So of course we're talking about a ag tech accelerator, which is at the beginning of that journey. So today um, we're going to hear from Jack. We're going to hear a, about challenges and opportunities for ag tech startups moving into the next year. And of course we hope to hear a little bit more about the plans. Um, now that they are falling into place in a more formal manner for the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. So thanks so much, Jack, for being with us and I'll have you take it away. All right, uh, thank you, Laura. And thanks for everybody at Research Park for giving me an opportunity to kind of go over this. And, and uh, this is a topic that I've been passionate about for a long time and I'm really excited to share uh, some of my observations and, and my opinions and also to hear your experiences. So I'll, I'll take a break every once in a while to give uh, Laura and Kathy a chance to let me know if anything pops up in the chat um, and, uh, and to take questions. So, um, all right. So challenges and opportunities for ag, there's, there's a lot, um, there's a lot that startups have to deal with. I think startups in ag, and I'm a little biased, but I think startups in ag kind of tend to face some unique challenges. And so um, to, kind of, uh, to kind of kick the conversation off, I think it's important to kind of have, well, I guess first I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit on, on my background. As Laura alluded to, I, I, worked, for, uh, I worked for Agable um, prior to their acquisition by Nutrien in 2018. I continued to work for Nutrien until October this past year. Um, I had also worked for uh, sort of a startup within a corporation uh, prior to that that focused on uh, drones and drones for ag. Um, I consider myself to be a data-driven evangelist. Um, I think that good gut instincts are, are, are good, and I think that they've accomplished a lot for people, but um, I think having data, having access to data, being able to leverage it in your decision-making um, is a is a boost no matter what your baseline is. So if you don't have good gut instincts, you really need data. And if you have good gut instincts, the data will just make your instincts that much better. Um, you can't react to what you know. I'm sorry, you can react to what you know. Um, uh, you cannot react to what you don't know. And the more you know, the better you can react. So um, if we're going to talk about challenges that face startups, I think it's really good to set a baseline for what a startup is. And I had alluded to before, I mentioned that I worked for a startup within a corporation. A lot of people don't really think of those as being startups, but um, I think when you look at the thought leaders in startup space, and I've got a couple of them, quotes from a couple of them on here, um, they do have a pretty expansive definition of startup that isn't limited to uh, people eating ramen in, a, in their mother's basement. So um, to combine these two uh, definitions of a startup um, from Paul Graham and Eric Ries, um, I think that I think it's helpful to think of a startup as being an institution that's built for rapid growth and, of course, delivers new product and services. The extreme uncertainty, I think, is a critical uh, is a critical piece of that, because if it wasn't uncertain, if, the, if that if that knowledge wasn't uncertain and if everybody knew it, then we would already have a product in that space. This this innovation is how we discover uncharted territory in terms of, of human knowledge, to be honest. So um, with that in mind, how, how, how do startups even accomplish this? How do startups achieve rapid growth under conditions of extreme uncertainty? And the answer is, uh, and this is, a, this is kind of a, <laughs> this is not an action plan in terms of an answer, but I think it's, it's helpful to sort of frame your thinking about what, um, how startups can accomplish this. The first thing is to aggressively learn to dispel the uncertainty, shine light into all of the dark corners about the things that you don't understand or you haven't learned yet around your business, not necessarily around your tech, around your business. Um, and that means uh, that knowledge that comes from dispelling that uncertainty can be fed into your growth engines as new knowledge to refine how you do business. 
And that might mean refining your tech, but it might also mean refining other things as well. And if you're focused on optimizing your growth, anything that isn't contributing to that growth is a drag on your business. So anything that's not moving you forward is 100% holding you back. So it's getting in the way and, and those are the things that's waste that should be eliminated. Um, and so there's an, there's an obvious bias for action through all of this um, and innovating in the ag sector pre presents unique challenges to being able to get this done for a number of reasons that I'm going to, um, that I'm going to go over it. Obviously, ag innovation is hard. It's hard because the premise of startups, you'll hear people talk about this all the time. It's a driving, um, it's a driving mission behind agile software development framework. And, and uh, this idea that you do rapid iterations and release new versions of your technology. Well, if you have one harvest, one plant, one average year, one average yield per field per year, you're not going to get the kinds of rapid iteration that people might get if they were developing a music app or something like that. Um, and so it's, it's really hard to, to iterate quickly on your, um, on your technology as well as all of your delivery platforms. The adoption curves are gradual in agriculture. And my favorite example of that, that was really eye-opening for me when I started to learn a little bit more about the history of innovation in ag, auto steer has been around for 25 years. That means it's taken auto steer 25 years to get to where it is today. And it's indisputably a benefit to agriculture, but it, it, there is still progress to be made in terms of accessibility and affordability, even around such a basic, uh, well, nowadays, I think we would think of it as being a pretty basic technology. So you start thinking about technologies that are even more disruptive and that change the way farmers do things even more than auto steer, which honestly doesn't really change anything other than they're not turning the tractor anymore, right? So it's, it's relatively low disruption, but it still takes a long time to get that adoption. So that's, that's a, unique, a unique challenge in, in ag. The other thing is growers have really long memories. And um, the consequence of that is that the acquisition costs can be really high because they tend to like to do what they've always done. But the churn costs are even higher because if you make a misstep and you lose a grower as a customer, it could be on the extreme a generation before they um, or they are willing to try your product again. So again, that kind of impacts your iteration as well as your customer traction. And the last thing that makes innovation hard, and this is not so much a negative challenge as much as it is just uh, the laws of physics around innovating in ag, this sandbox that we play in where we're developing these new technologies and, and blazing a, a, a brave path into the future, this sandbox that we play in is somebody's livelihood. In many cases, it may be the land that they grew up on, or even in the case of a large ag corporation, it's, it's in many cases a, a business that they've been in for multiple generations. Even on the case of mega 10,000, 20,000 acre farms, um, these are oftentimes run by people that are, that are deeply entrenched in the, ag, uh, in the ag business. Again, possibly for multiple generations. And the, the takeaway there is that ag is deeply personal and you have to respect that. You don't, you don't wanna try to, to try to discount that or take that out of the equation because that can't be done. And the more you fight it, I think the, the harder it is uh, to relate to your customers. So I want to dive into these a little bit more, um, each of them, and kind of talk a little bit about um, what can possibly be done to uh, what startups can do to try to mitigate the impact that these challenges have on their um, development. So for the iteration cycles, um, the obvious, the first thing that you can do is just make sure that you're prepared and to try not to be totally um, at the mercy of those, uh, those cycles. So the more that you can do off season, the better, um, I, and and I think that scenario-based research is is paramount. If you think about the um, extreme uncertainty that you, as a founder and and thought leader, are struggling with, if you think about trying to put a survey in front of your user um, to try to dispel that uncertainty, you're sort of asking them, who are completely unfamiliar with your solution, to try to shed some light on. The problem and there's there's some validity to that so i'm, I'm not going to say the surveys are a bad idea but i think observation is oftentimes more telling and more powerful so i think that um surveys can be valuable valuable but they should be audited by direct observation and I, my favorite example of that is if you ask me 
if I would ever eat chocolate cake for breakfast, the answer is, of course not. But if I were to wake up tomorrow morning, come downstairs and find a chocolate cake on my counter, I think everybody knows what I'm going to have for breakfast that day. And so what people say and what they do are not always the same thing. So observation is very powerful, very, very important. You should be able to run multiple experiments simultaneously. So for those of you that are working on the more on the tech side, um, this is if you guys already know exactly what I'm talking about here, being able to run multiple experiments at the same time and to control for the different variables and things like that. But I'm talking about more than just the tech. You can run multiple experiments on your business model at the same time, on your pricing, uh, your price model, your delivery platform, your revenue model, you, the user experience, absolutely. The more that you can do at the same time, the more you're going to make use of those limited windows that you have to get in front of users at specific times of the year, if your product is limited to specific times of the year. And uh, what you're looking for in all of this, remember that the bias for action that we had talked about, that I talked about before, and the importance of startups being able to achieve rapid growth, you're not looking for a baby step in a direction. You're looking for a quantum leap that unlocks enormous potential. And so it's not going to be something where there's going to be any question when you find it. And it's not going to be something where you sort of oscillate, you know, for infinity, trying to optimize this one tenth of a percent out of some part of your business. It's, uh, it's going to be, you know, a giant step forward. Those are the kinds of, of disruptions that you're looking for. I think it's also really important for startups to be rehearsed for intraday iteration. So what I mean by that is uh, you should be prepared to sprint during the busy seasons to get as much real life feedback as possible. And you have to be well trained for that sprint. You can't show up to your first day of weightlifting and expect to lift 500 pounds. So if you go into these busy seasons ready, expecting to iterate, but you have not as a company had the discipline or, or practice to turn, um, turn improvements around on a short time frame. Uh, then you're really going to struggle with that. So that's something that should be ingrained in the in your DNA of being able to turn around improvements very quickly in days. Um, not necessarily tech. I know not all tech can be <laughs> iterated on or improved in days, but certainly the delivery platforms and UI UX pricing, things like that, those are all things you can tweak, um, should be able to tweak um, pretty easily. Um, I think assumptions are like treasure chests. And we tend to lock them and never open them because we've made the assumption and moved on. So I think it's important for these rapid iterations to be ruthless about those assumptions so that um, you can unlock those hidden opportunities to learn something. Don't protect your assumptions. And it's also imperative to know what you're testing for. You should have a defined hypothesis about everything you test. You should, be, you should not be shooting from the hip and being like, that looks good. Let's try that and maybe things will get better. You should have a very defined parameters for your experiments and know what you're testing for and be able to measure the outcomes. And like I said before, I'm, I'm sort of a self-described data-driven decision-making evangelist. So I have a little bit of a bias to, to measurement, but I think the, the, the uh, history will bear me out on, on the value of being able to an, analyze the results of what you do. Um, Talking about gradual curves, uh, fortune favors the bold on this one. Uh, we know it's hard and it's a mountain you're going to have to climb. So some tools that you can use to do that. First, of all, you have to be brave about that. Like you have to be tenacious. You cannot be dis get discouraged. You can't just roll over and be like, well, it'll be 10 years. And then eventually everybody will use this technology I'm working on. You have to maintain that, that, um, that passion and drive for getting your, uh, your technology adopted. And to do that, you have to grow your network. So I'll tell you as a person who is extremely uncomfortable with cold calls, cold outreaching, and all of those associated things. And my personal inbox is sitting at something like 2,500 emails, um, a terrible person. So, but professionally, um, especially in this role, um, it's not that way. My inbox is sitting at something like 30 emails that have come in since yesterday morning, because I know that it's important for, uh, for the benefit of our program, and I'll talk a little bit about why when I talk more about our program, that we have a powerful network of people that we can turn to for advice for the benefit of our startups. And for startup founders, it's imperative that you have a network of mentors that you can turn to for advice and customers that you can tur turn to to get feedback. So growing your network is imperative. This is the lifeblood for how you'll grow, especially early on. 
when doubling your customers means two instead of one. You should also know where on the curve, ooh, there's a typo. <laughs> you should also know where on this curve you and your customers are. Um, and so uh, this is a graph you guys have all probably seen before, but if you, if you notice, and I'm gonna see, yeah, okay, so you should be able to see my cursor. If you just, if you ignore this distribution to the right of the early adopters, and you just look to the left of the early adopters, if you were to if you were to describe the rate of growth here, this is pretty exponential. This is looking pretty exponential. So that that's exactly the kind of wrapper growth that you're looking at at the beginning, and you fund this growth with investment. So that's that's sort of like all of the calling cards of startups start to make sense here. And this is this this exponential part of the curve right here. This is where the magic happens, and this is this is where growing the network and addressing these other issues unlock the potential for that type of rapid growth. Uh, when it comes to overcoming the long memories of growers, I think it's really imperative to be honest. The whole industry is really, I mean, there are still deals being done with a handshake. And certainly there's fewer than there, than there once were, but um, there are, there, there's, it's, in, it's imperative to build a sense of trust between you and your partners, whether those are customers or corporations or wherever they are. It's the, cu the currency you're dealing, you're trading in, so you have to be careful with you should also choose your partners carefully. And so if, if you admit, if you remember the slide I just showed with the with the, the adoption curve, those early adopters, those are your first customers. They enjoy fiddling and experimenting and, and they know that they're getting more of a Blackberry and not an iPhone. So they're okay with that. They, they, they want to go on that journey with you. If you find those users, those are perfect people to get feedback from. You don't wanna build for them, but they're gonna help you know when something is just completely broken. And they're going to forgive you for it because they appreciate you getting them a preview of what is to come. So um, if you partner poorly in this regard, then you'll end up spending an enormous amount of your time and effort trying to maintain relationships instead of, instead of learning. It's also important to know your customer better. So I didn't say know your customer well, because it sort of means if you know your customer well, you, you can check that off. And, and it's not a checkable box. This is a, this, is a, this is a journey that you're on for as long as you have customers, that you should know your customer better. So that means how do you know whether or not you're doing that well? Well, you should, be, you should have regular I didn't know that moments. If you don't have regular I didn't know that moments, something may be very terribly wrong. Um, and so, it, because it, that's an that's a indication that you may have stopped learning, which is terrible. So, um, important to always, always be learning more about your customers. Thinking about livelihoods and legacies, um, I think they're closely related. Uh, it's really important to focus on incremental value creation. And I, I think of this as you should take the preschooler approach here. This is really, really hard, especially for engineers. I'm especially guilty of this. I could rattle off a day's worth of examples, but what I mean by the preschooler approach is I have a I have a I have a six year old just turned just turned six uh, a couple of weeks ago, and he comes home from kindergarten with these drawings, and and I would never say let's replace the contents of the Sistine Chapel with the drawings that my six year old came home with. But they're valuable because uh, I know he he sees them as being valuable. He wants to give me something that he thinks that I will find is valuable. And so even if it's a little bit messy and clearly handmade, the fact that it's personal and the fact that we have this relationship and the fact that you know he really did put his heart and soul into these drawings, that's valuable. And so you need to take more than a crayon drawing to your customers. But if you focus on delivering that incremental value creation, even if it's not the whole enchilada that's in your vision, the user doesn't necessarily have that vision. They're happy to just get a little piece of it. And so it's okay to ship something a little bit early as long as you do so in a way that is transparent, respectful, and to the right audience. Don't mass produce junk, but it's okay to show people what you're working on before it's beautiful. And they will help you make it beautiful. And a key part of that is being able to empathize about the problem. You have to understand their problem space in the absence of your solution. So if your problem statement, if your problem statement obviously leads people to your solution, it's probably a little bit too contrived. Problem statements should be written in such a way that you can tell 
you can see the problem from the user's perspective, not from the solution's perspective. Um, and so I've, I've hit this uh, a lot of different ways, sort of sideways, but I'll say it directly. It's imperative to be respectful to, to all of your partners and to earn their respect. And that having users and growing your user base is more valuable than your opinions. And this kind of, to me, sort of presents a, a great startup paradox that I've been reflecting more and more on late, especially lately, is sort of this paradox of being humble while also having the audacity to take your idea to the world. So you should be audacious in your what? You're building something the world has never seen before, and you have the right to be proud about that, and you should shout it from the mountaintops and tell everybody about it. However, the way that you take that idea to people, I think you have to have a great deal of humility so that they don't feel bulldozed by your brilliance. Okay, so um, I've talked a lot about sort of what I consider to be the, the heart of ag tech, which is focused on say growing crops and crop management and, uh, and, and inputs, software support, et cetera, those kinds of things that are sort of the first things that come to mind when you think about ag tech. But ag is supported by other technologies as well, including supply chain and, and food tech and, and things like that. So we have some people that are interested in our accelerator, which I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and so just to kind of speak to some of the challenges that some of these adjacent industries deal with, there's a huge problem around, a huge challenge around documentation management. Um, the documents are sometimes paper, um, which obviously you can't get at through an API. So there's a, there's a challenge to be overcome there. There are problems with data management and integration. Um, I've got some personal experience with this, and I can tell you that I have yet to have a non-painful experience trying to integrate with uh, other data sources. Um, and it can very quickly turn into a distraction. You're not working on your tech, on your core solution, if you're trying to figure out how to get um, one data shape to fit another data shape. So, um, but that may still be very necessary. So uh, it's a challenge to watch out for. Quality management, well, so could go to, you know, this could refer to data quality in terms of things like um, uncalibrated sensors, antiquated databases, manual entries, misspellings, ambiguous units. These are all very terrifying to me, <laughs> um, but uh, they're still sort of the, the again, the, the laws of physics in, in dealing in this, in this industry. There's also quality management in terms of things like food freshness and quality and uh, how close is the food to the customer, how do you get it to the customer without degrading the quality? And there are challenges, challenges and solutions to be had there as well. Um, everything is kind of an island and there are no bridges. And so there's limited means of sharing data between the islands, which makes for a lack of transparency. Um, and then I think there's a huge misunderstanding in ag where you'll get groups of people that think farmers are trying to kill people with their chemicals and you get farmers that are um, frustrated with other people trying to tell them how to grow and then it's destroying their business. And so how you communicate about your solution is also really, really important so that you can try to contribute to dispelling the miscommunications and misunderstandings that, um, that we're sort of dealing with right now. So that's kind of, I'll, I'll pause. I'll pause just for a second because I went through a whole lot and I kind of wanted to get some feedback from folks on what you're seeing in terms of challenges and uh, maybe some of what, what you've struggled with and if you have specific thoughts, questions, or feedback on, on what we've covered so far. Quiet group today. <laughs> Jack, can you tell us a little bit more about some of those misunderstandings that you were just referencing? So perhaps people having technology without a lot of domain expertise in agriculture and how they show it, what you described as some humility when interacting with a new audience. Yeah. Yeah, so um, so there's a few different ways. I think one of the one of the things that I think is um, what, what, I think the trap that can sometimes be set is this binary this this reduction of challenging gradient problem spaces by reducing them to binary uh, topics that are easy to fight about. <laughs> and I think one of I'll use uh, I'll use fertilizers as an example. So there's sort of this argument that fertilizers are bad. And there are there's evidence that supports the fact that sometimes fertilizers don't do good things. And sometimes they do bad things. Does that mean that we're supposed to stop using fertilizers altogether? The answer is, of course not. So um, the 
are there areas where we can improve there? Yes, let's talk about that. That's a gradient space. That's not a binary. We're not reducing that to a binary thing that we fight about. And if you are, uh, if you are sort of an early, if you're a tech visionary, you see a version of the future that only you can see. And that's your special gift. Because if anybody else could see it, somebody else would have done it already. So the fact that you can see a picture of the future that no one else can see is very, very special, but it also comes with the responsibility of being able to figure out how you take that version of the future that doesn't exist yet and you make it a reality by bringing people along with you, not dragging them against their will. Um, people have really strong heels. So if they dig in, you're not dragging them along with you. It's just painful for everybody. So it's, I think, um, I think that sort of misunderstanding that um, that that uh, that you're that you have a savior tech and that everyone should flock to it and, and embrace it. I think that's a that's a trap that's really easy to fall into. That you're entitled to success because you're brilliant. Um, you're entitled to work really hard, like most other brilliant people. Not necessarily that it's going to be a gift. And and I think what what you set yourself up for when you have that understanding is. Um, sort of a, a, a quite a bit of frustration when things don't go well and then you you can either end up with a grudge or you shelve the idea and then the world doesn't get to see that future that you saw so um, so I think it's really important to make sure that 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 you that you and it's on you as the visionary to bridge that gap it's not on it's not on your user you have to bring your vision to them um, so, so that, that may mean being putting yourself in uncomfortable situations, like I said, sending a bunch of emails, listening to a whole bunch of people, um, listening more than you're talking, those, those kinds of things. I'm doing a very bad job of that, by the way, <laughs> listening more than I'm talking. Does that, does that help, Laura? Is that kind of what you were? Yeah, and I think another thing, there are several investors that are on this conversation today. The world of ag, as you described in the beginning, has a different time horizon than the release of other types of products and technologies given the growing cycle. Can you speak a little bit more to that of how to set milestones and timetables that might differ from other startup software or other inventions? Yeah, so I'm going to use some I'm going to use some comic book math. So if we say um, the Looney Tunes math, I guess. So if uh, if we think about uh, every iteration is a learning experience. Startups have to learn an alert certain amount before they accomplish, before they reach critical mass, say exitable max. <laughs> so if uh, let's say the average startup has to go through 500 iterations, well, let's use a more reasonable number. Let's say every startup has to go through 50 iterations, not talking about major pivots, just 50 iterations of their product before they achieve exitable max. At the, at the most, uh, sort of um, surface, superficial uh, understanding of what it takes to iterate an ag. If you only get one shot per year to do an iteration, then it would take 50 years for a ag tech startup to achieve the same level of iteration. Except that the world changes over the course of those 50 years, which means that in addition to that slower iterative um, uh, opportunities, the landscape changes as well. So when you're setting expectations or you know, when you're setting your own expectations, it's sort of what can I expect to see in ad? I think from an investor standpoint, one of the things to realize is that you're not going to see the rapid in season. And I mean, like planting season, ag season, crop season, crop season is probably the best term to use. You're not going to see the kinds of rapid iteration in crop season that um, you might see in other technologies, especially if the learning is that something fundamental in the underlying model has to change. Um, so what does that, what, the other thing that that means from an investor is that you have an opportunity to add something to your bag when you're looking at evaluating startups. And that is, well, how well have they handled that problem? How well are they going to be able to continue moving. And I think that's actually the most valuable takeaway from an investor standpoint, because you may find somebody who just by dumb luck landed on 70% of a complete solution the first try. Well, 
that's fine. But if they don't have a history of learning and a history of iteration, they're still a wild card because you don't know how well they're going to learn to get that last 30% that they need. So I think a history of being able to iterate quickly um, speaks volumes about uh, an ag tech startup's capability of dealing in that kind of space. There's a question from Sharia on that. Are you referring to the creation of an MVP, the same number of iterations, or the, the whole product life cycle? <laughs> um, okay, so uh, yeah, I think the way that she's asking, I think I think MVP is the right way to answer that. And the reason why the reason why I'm hesitant to sort of be like, oh yeah, it's totally an MVP, is because um, and, and the MVP is a valuable goal, but it's also a little bit of a lie because you're not done when you get there. That's, that's like the beginning. So you kind of have to, the landscape changes a little bit when you get to an MVP. So it's sort of, there isn't really a point at which the, there isn't really a point at which the paradigm completely changes. So up to MVP, yes. Beyond MVP, yes. All the way through exit, yes. As long as you have customers, yes. Um, they continue to be challenges and continue to be things that should be top of mind for anybody working on innovating in ag. But yeah, it, I guess for the analogy that I gave, number of, innovation, number of iterations to an MVP, it takes more time, it can take more time to do that, to get to that point in ag than in other spaces depending on the nature of the technology. So there's no easy answers, sorry. Okay, I think we can probably keep going. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator. So um, this is an accelerator. So we, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about what that, what that means, but to get started, why, why, why an ag tech why Accelerator, why Illinois, why here? Um, and the reason why is because we have local talent with a global impact because we have an ag tech hub here in the form of Research Park, which is home to a list of companies that you're welcome to read. We also have 500,000 acres of the best farmland in the world. And I phrase that very carefully because we don't, I'm not gonna get in an argument with a soil scientist about the quality of our soil. I think what I mean is the whole ecosystem from soil, weather patterns, et cetera. Like we have some of the best, this is some of the best place, this is one of the best places in the world to grow anything. Um, and then we're also, the University of Illinois, um, it's also a top five university in both computer science and agriculture. There's only one other university in the country that can lay claim to that. We have the number two precision ag uh, college um, with Parkland College here. So I like to say, that this community puts the ag and tech in ag tech. <laughs> and um, so there, I, I don't know that there really would be a better place on the planet to, to do something, to do a program like this. Um, and so when I say do a program like this, what I'm referring to is one of the first things that, that this accelerator is going to be doing, um, which is the um, uh, something that we call a G beta program. So um, this, uh, this G beta program is a defined, and this is sort of a fundamental difference between say something like a, an accelerator and something like an incubator. An incubator is sort of like a, a semi-permanent space, semi-permanent program. There's not an established, not always an established start and end dates. Um, certainly with an accelerator, we have mo very defined narrow end dates. In the case of this program, it's a seven week program. Um, and uh, each of the five, we'll, we'll, we're, we're taking applications right now. Um, and each of the five teams or five companies that we select to participate in the program will get a $25,000 investment. Um, and that's via an uncapped convertible note uh, if you're not raising, or if you are currently raising, it'll be on your existing financing terms. So over the course of those seven weeks, um, we will uh, work with you individually. We take a concierge approach to working with startups. So we don't have a pre-built syllabus where you do X, Y, and Z in week one all the way through week seven. We have a couple of things that you'll check, but the overall time, the, the real focus is on helping you build your business. I've gotten questions from people that sort of say, well, how much time is this going to take away from your business, from my business? 
because I've got a business to run and I don't want to take a whole bunch of time away from that to sit in a classroom. So the answer to that is you're not going to sit in the classroom and it takes exactly zero times away from your business because we're focused on your business. We're focused on building it. Like 99.9% .9 of the things that we talk about and the time that we spend together is focused on your specific business, your specific challenges, and unlocking growth that is specific to what you're trying to do. So um, there are, we accomplish that by um, regularly connecting you with um, a wide range of resources that could be helpful. So that, that includes mentors with specialties in everything from ag engineering to HR, to computer science and computer engineering, platform building, do I need to hire a CTO, legal, is this term sheet reasonable, et cetera. So you get the opportunity, it's not free labor, we're not connecting you with free labor or anything like that, but certainly mentors who can offer you advice on how to take next steps and solve problems in this space. We contribute um, a third kind of an outside perspective on your business to look at somewhat your assumptions, which I talked about before, and look at your business, give you a, an outside view that could potentially help you ask questions that you hadn't thought to ask and answer those questions through the support of that network and the materials that we have. At the end of the program, this is something I'm very excited about because we do G beta generated as GD, G beta programs all over the country. G beta is one of the, or excuse me, generator is one of the co-sponsors of the Illinois Agtech Accelerator. So it's, we're, it's kind of the generator recipe uh, applied to all of the um, ingredients that we have in this community. So the, um, the thing that I'm really excited about is at the end of this program, at the end of all of our G-Beta programs, we always do what we call a pitch night. So it gives the five startups an opportunity to pitch to an audience that we put together for them. And so in the past, this is dozens, maybe over a hundred investors. I think the last one that I saw, we had 210 attendees. So they're usually pretty big events. However, this one, we're partnering with Research Park, um, and we're going to do this pitch night as part of the Ag Tech Summit, which attracts corporations that maybe don't always think of themselves as being startup investors, but they are absolutely candidates to be customers. So that means you can imagine where a large corporation that maybe isn't interested in investing in early stage startups, but they would absolutely be interested in getting a preview of what the future of Ag looks like. And they may even want to participate in a beta test with you, which of course gives you access to more customers. So we're hoping, um, we're expecting that aligning this pitch night at the end of the seven weeks in early March um, uh, with the Ag Tech Summit, we'll get a lot of really excited, really relevant eyeballs on the pitches that our startups will, uh, will present in that meeting. So the details, um, we're gonna, we're accepting applications through the end of this month. Um, we'll do interviews and select the cohort um, in early December. I'm hoping that we can get that take, get that the five selected by uh, December 12th. Uh, we'll kick the program off on January 20th. Um, we're, we're a little bit fluid on that one. We're still considering the January 13th versus January 20th, um, and uh, we'll do that pitch night, like I said, on uh, March 9th um, as part of the Ag Tech Summit. Okay, so I kind of alluded to any any questions about our program, I guess. So I'll pause there. Um, what's required at the time of application? Uh, really just the application. So we don't, oh, so the application is five or six questions. They're not really lengthy, it's pretty, pretty quick. And then um, you have the option of uh, submitting supporting materials. So if you have a pitch deck, that's good. If you have one pager, that's good. If you don't have either of those, that's fine. Those are standard things that we generally expect to work with people on um, in the G-Beta program. Um, and if you do have, if you're really proud of the materials that you have, we'll, we'll look at them. We won't spend a ton of time on them in the G-Beta program. But if you don't have those materials, then we'll spend time working on how to put your story together in a way that's attractive to investors. Um, so there's not really a lot that's required at the time of, uh, of application. Um, we're not requiring people to be on site for this program. It's completely remote. So, uh, so you can be really anywhere in the world um, and be eligible for the program. Um, we're not requiring people to have a connection to the community, but it definitely doesn't hurt you or us for that matter. So um, 
So we're really trying to keep the doors as wide open as possible for this because we don't want to say no um, to something that um, that we don't fully understand. So we're going to give everybody the opportunity to apply, and then once we go through applications, we'll figure out the what the right five companies look like. Jack, can you speak to the stage of companies that would be most appropriate to apply? Yes. So. Uh, with this being an accelerator, we're looking at companies that are ready to uh, to grow exponentially. So if you have a tech that hasn't been tested yet, that might that might be too early. Um, and if you have sort of a steady state revenue and you're not interested in growing exponentially, then that's also probably not a good fit. Um, so the sweet spot, I would say, is really those those companies that have the beginnings of a product, but maybe it's not, maybe they don't have an MVP, or um, or maybe it's still just uh, it's it's a proof of concept, um, and they're looking to test the viability of that. Um, all the way up to companies that have perhaps an MVP, but are looking to optimize that a little bit more. So I would say on the very early stage, napkins probably a little bit too early. Like if your idea is just basically on a napkin, that's probably a little bit too early, um, but maybe not. So I, again, I don't want to discourage anybody from applying. Um, if you think you've got a really good case or this sounds really interesting to you, we will absolutely work with you on whether or not you're at the right point. If you're raising a series B or beyond, then you're, that's again on the other end of the gradient. Um, but we've seen some people have expressed interest where they're pivoting into a new space and they want to take advantage of the accelerator to support that pivot. So they're approaching their pivot as a as a as that sort of um, disruptive technology into um, you know um, extreme uncertainty. So um, I don't want to discourage anybody from applying, but that's kind of that that's sort of that sweet spot somewhere between like pre-seed and say pre-series B. Um, okay, so I want to take just a couple of minutes to talk about what I mean, what we mean by accelerator. So I think this will also kind of help um sort of shed some light on what we do and um sort of what kind of companies might be might be good candidates so um i kind of mentioned this before if we were to contrast um accelerators and incubators um accelerators if ours in particular you know we make an investment we offer this mentorship we offer office space we do have space in the atkins building on campus we're gonna have to figure out the covid friendly to leverage that space in the spring with whatever happens between now and January. I'm not even gonna bother trying to predict that. Um, and it's cohort based. So that means we take a group of five, we run a group of five. So um, that's in contrast to incubators um, um, and where there's not often an investment. There are shared amenities. Um, and I will actually, this is sort of pre-built generator material, but I do kind of want to go off script a little bit and commend the Research Park and Enterprise Works for their mentorship programs because the incubator we have here does have that mentorship available. It's not just the shared office space, but there is shared office space. And then it's also on a more ongoing basis. So there's not necessarily a group of people that come and go together. So there's a little bit of a difference between say what you might uh, get from Enterprise Works and what you might get through this program. I see them as being immensely complimentary. So, uh, so it's really exciting to kind of be fostering that relationship with companies that may want to go through a seven week accelerator type of program while, while at Enterprise Works in preparation for Enterprise Works on their way out of Enterprise Works, really kind of wherever it fits in their business. Um, what do accelerators look for? Well, we are an investor. We're looking for people that we can work with. And so I would say, you know, people that are collaborative, it's, that's an important thing that we look at. We do look at people that are complete. So. If you have a brilliant idea for artificial intelligence, but you have no idea how to write what a, say, convolutional neural network is, that's a little bit of a red flag. Um, we're looking for people who are capable. So it kind of goes back to that same thing, where if you have a textbook knowledge of how reinforcement learning works, but you can't write Python, that's probably a problem. We're looking for people that are committed. If your first question is, I have a full-time job, so I don't know if I have time to do the accelerator, and to be completely honest, you probably like a full-time job outside of your startup. You're, that's actually probably a little early stage for us. We're really looking for people who are willing to commit to 
of being full time on this. This is running a startup is a full time job. So, um, the we're looking for people who have a good idea and some indication of traction. I, I'm gonna kind of temper this one a little bit and say if you don't have any customers yet, that's not awesome. You may not be like a stellar candidate, but if you check all of the other boxes, then that's something we might be able to work with. Um, and so because of the G beta program and the level of investment, the risk to our investors is relatively low financially. So that means that, um, that we're willing to look at earlier stage uh, companies that perhaps don't have a ton of traction. So don't be intimidated by that. A market opportunity is that is important. So we do have to be able to come to some level of understanding between your vision for the future and how we make that vision a reality to make sure that the idea is big enough to warrant um, the investment and work and vision for what a startup uh, can be. When should you apply to an accelerator? When you want to grow more and faster. So this kind of goes back to that rap, we've been hitting this point a lot, I know. It goes back to that idea of rapid growth. So we're trying to unlock some potential that your company has that is exponential explosive growth. Um, it's possible. We've seen companies do it. We're really excited to work with companies to do it again. So um, you should also apply to an accelerator when your team is committed full time, when you're starting to get some traction, when you have a little bit of revenue, you have perhaps some patents are taken care of, or you have pre-orders. Pre-orders aren't necessarily revenue. You got some people that have expressed interest, letters of intent, things like that, where you've kind of shopped the idea around a little bit and it's not just something that you've come up with that morning or whatever. Um, you, I mentioned this before, the importance of expanding your network. So you need to be ready to do that. When you're researching uh, accelerators, and I'm gonna go through these and talk specifically about how the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, the answer to these questions for Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator, you should know the terms. I went over the terms before, so I'll, but I'll recite them again. So we invest $25,000 on your current terms if you're raising, an uncapped convertible note if you're not raising. Some accelerators charge fees, we don't. There's no pay to play with us. Equity for service, some companies will take, or some accelerators will take equity in your company in exchange for fundraising, legal, or marketing. We also do not do that. Um, there's some advice here around getting into the accelerator that you shouldn't negotiate the salary before you get the job. It's really good advice. You should yeah, definitely get offered to, uh, you should get that, that offer of acceptance or red letter of acceptance or whatever before you start worrying too much about the details. Uh, I have had people whose first question to me after saying hello is wanting to know all of the ins and outs and gory details of the uncapped convertible note. And um, that's not always a great way to start the conversation. If you don't get into the accelerator, you should ask for feedback. You won't. You should absolutely ask for feedback. I can promise your generator is going to give you feedback. We, we will give you feedback on your application and, and explain kind of what our thought process was and why you didn't get in. You should stay engaged and you should apply again, especially if the accelerator says, you should work on these things. You come back a year later and you said, I really want to attend this accelerator. I applied last year, you said to work on these things and I worked on these things and here's all the data that says I'm doing better in that area. That's really, really powerful. You have a stellar application at that point. So please do that. Um, these, these, are, uh, <clears throat> these are legitimately kind of stupid questions. If you ask if you're too far along for an accelerator, the answer is no. Um, now, whether or not it's this accelerator or not, it's a different question. We kind of talked a little bit about the kinds of companies that this accelerator is looking for. Um, is the expectation 40 hours a week? No, it's actually probably more than that. So it's most definitely full time. So the reason for that is because this isn't something that you do in addition to your business. This is something that you do as part of your business. The same as if you were to hire a consultant, meeting with that consultant isn't something that you do above and beyond your job. It's part of your job. So um, the difference is we are way cheaper than a consultant. So um, yeah, and then the last thing, I love this, I love this. This is like life lesson on a PowerPoint right here. Shots on goal are paramount. Uh, the GAN Accelerator, which is a, a network of accelerators, um, they kind of share statistics. There were 35,000 total applications in 2018. 3.8% of those applications got in, That's a, that is, more that is a lower acceptance rate than the two Ivy League schools that are listed on here. What that means is it's really hard to get into an accelerator. So the answer is 
try to apply to as many accelerators as possible. If you, if you kind of think about this further back, that means that the whole guiding principle for you as a startup founder should be persistence. Shots on goal doesn't just apply to accelerators, it applies to customers, it applies to investors, it applies to every single opportunity in front of you. You want to try to say, you want to try to keep the windows and doors open on as many options as possible so that um, you're not turning your back on a potential opportunity. You have to balance that with your time. It's one of the things that makes this very difficult is having lots of options and figuring out what the right one right one is, but narrowing your options prematurely or only giving yourself one or two and saying, I'm going to put all of my eggs in that basket is really, really dangerous and should be avoided at all costs. So with that, that concludes my presentation. I want to thank everybody for, for listening, listening to my opinions, and I'm happy to take your questions or hear your thoughts or tell me why I'm wrong. Hey, Jack, this is Bob Coverdill. Um, how are you doing, sir? Doing well. Um, are you looking at a preference towards, say, a software development or hardware, like an implement or an auto steer or a service? You know, do, do you have a sense of where you're heading? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I'm, I'm going to expand the list a little bit more to include things like how far off of ag tech into food tech would we go and how far into, say, supply chain would we go? So I think because we're looking for the rapid growth, um, people associate that with software more than hardware, but uh, it's certainly not impossible with hardware. So we don't, we don't have a defined, um, we, don't, we don't have a definition around, well, we like software more than hardware or, or something like that. Um, what we're really looking for are some really compelling stories and, and compelling potential. So, um, and it also kind of depends where if you're the only, if you're the only hardware applicant and you're a stellar applicant, you know, then yeah, we would probably take you over a, a not so stellar software company. So I don't, I don't know that I have a, a really good concrete answer to that because I won't know until we see the app, application. Okay, great. Thank you. Jack, um, so what is after you have this cohort coming up? I know that there are plans for uh, future cohorts. Can you talk a little bit about that? Ooh, actually, I, I promised that I will. But when you said what comes after this cohort, I wanted to mention one more very, very important thing about our accelerator. We're not done after those seven weeks. We're not. Done. You could be done if you want. You never talk to us again. That's fine. I'm probably going to pester you until you tell me to leave you alone. What I mean by that is that if you come, if you, well, first of all, we actually ask you and we expect you to send us a monthly update after you complete the program so that we can keep track of your progress. That helps us know how well we're doing and it helps you make sure that you still have somebody that you're accountable to in terms of reporting on your progress. There's a ton of value in that, um, just in simply in reporting on your progress because then you actually have to look at the numbers. Beyond that, if you come across something you say, hey, we're having another problem, we covered this type of thing in the program, or it's a new problem or whatever, can you help? The answer will be, we will absolutely do our best. Now that doesn't mean that we're gonna put you back in an accelerator for seven weeks, but it absolutely does mean that our network of mentors, investors, our ability to help you try to find customers and help is, is, a, is a commitment that we stand behind for as long as you wanna work so that's what comes after G beta for G beta participants. This summer, um, and I have, I have um, I'm trying to think of if I have the date, I don't have the dates off the top of my head. Sometime in May, we will be, actually, so right after we close this program in early March, I think mid-March, we will open up applications for another program that we call a flagship generator program. And the flagship generator program is a 12 week long accelerator. It's very similar to this one, same premise runs for 12 weeks. We'll cover a little bit more, quite a bit more material um, and give you a lot more, well, three months to, uh, to take advantage of our resources. Um, there's a $100,000 investment as part of that program. And uh, that will run kicks off, I think, in June and runs through October, if I remember correctly, give or take a week or two around that time frame. And uh, applications for that, I think, are going to close at the end of May. So that's what's next. And then we intend for these, both of these, 
the G beta program that's the $25,000 investment in seven weeks, as well as the generator flagship, which is the $100,000 in 12 weeks, we're going to be doing those every year. So we'll do two more of those next year. And there's no hard and fast rule that says participation in one, progr one program precludes you from participation in another program. And there's a really good case to be made where if you go through these seven weeks of the Illinois, if you're, if you're thinking, well, maybe I want to hold on for the $100,000, you should also consider that giving us seven weeks to work with you and to see how awesome you are may make us really excited about working you with you for 12 more weeks. So I want to emphasize participation in one program does not preclude you from participation in the other program. If you start trying to apply every summer for the $100,000 program, I, mean, I don't think that's going to work. But point being, don't not apply for this one because you think you want to hold out for the next one. Somebody participates in January, they still might be eligible to participate in the program in the summer if that's a natural progression. Yes. Yeah. And, and the summer program is 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 designed for more mature. That's kind of how we're approaching it. So the, the more mature companies, we're, we're going to skew uh, companies that are further along for the hundred thousand dollar program and so if you do an accelerator you're going to be further along so um absolutely there's there's nothing to prevent people that participate from applying and potentially getting into the the summer program and the other thing to point out they're highly competitive and i just got done mentioning how you should try to get as many shots on goal as possible so the the other thing that i'll mention too about getting your application in is we keep them so we work on uh, we did an ag an on we did a ag conference over the summer we had 500 startups that applied for our startup track as part of the conference and we have all of their information and we've been reaching out to them and, and having conversations about the program that i just talked about um and so once you're in the generator ecosystem you you already start to reap benefits of being in the generator ecosystem you're going to get feedback on your application feedback on how you you know, presented your business and made your case. Um, and on the fit, like that's really important is that your most authentic self may not be a good fit. And we need to, we need to discover that. So we're really looking at that, at that most authentic representation of your company. So don't try to make yourself attractive, be attractive and, and then tell us about that. So, um, uh, in, in just getting the application in puts you on our radar for all kinds of other programming, ag tech specific program that we do, including that on-ramp conference, this accelerator, um, the, both of these accelerator programs and other things that generator may do in the future. So it's, it's I, I think, I mean, I'm obviously a little biased. I think we're pretty good friends to have and we're pretty nice people for the most part. Well, thank you so much. We're at time at 102, and we really are excited about the Illinois Ag Tech Accelerator and to have Jack Mark joining as the managing director. <coughs> a lot of great insights to bring, and he's holding office hours four days a week. So if you want to get in touch with Jack, sign up for his office hours. It was in the chat, and we'll put it in the follow-up notes. Thanks, and please apply if you're interested.